I never crossed them because you can't win. Never fight a battle you can't win. It's just crazy. Hey there, thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and I am Jeremy Lesniak, your fortunate host, the founder of Whistlekick Martial Arts. And today, I'm joined by Kyoshi Jim King. Man, we get into some good stuff. If you're new to the show, you might want to head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the show notes, links, bios, 317 other episodes, all available for free. And I bet you there are some names in there that you've seen before. Of course, if you want to check out the things that we make, you can find all of them at whistlekick.com. We're constantly rolling out new products, new services, new things to help you in your lifestyle as a martial artist. That's what we do. We support the martial arts community. My guest today is Kyoshi Jim King, a man that many of you may know as a forerunner in the movement to bring after-school programs to martial arts studios. He's well known for this, but we talk about a lot more than the business side of martial arts. This is a man who doesn't pull any punches, at least figuratively, and we get into some heavy topics. I think you'll enjoy this one. I know I did. So hang on. Here we go with Kyoshi Jim King. How are you, sir? I was just getting ready to call you. No, oh, yeah. well, you wouldn't have been able to call me. Well, there you go. <laughs> Our system doesn't take incoming calls. It routes through Skype and... All kinds of techie yeah, stuff. That... Uh, you, yeah, you're too techie for me. How old are you? <laughs> I'm 39, sir. Damn millennial. No, I... I no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I like I avocados, jam. but not that much. I know, I know. <laughs> um, I'm, I tried to give you a, a preemption of what I was... Because I'm old school. Old school. I'm not on any social media anywhere. I'm all aware of it. I'm aware, My wife does it, but I don't need to, so I don't do it. I don't text, and I... I don't do an uh, email blast for everybody and sign up people online. And then I get kids coming in here with two heads, you know, uh, and you can't count to three. Uh, everybody has to come to our school and, and uh, first before I'll sign anybody up. I wouldn't ever sign anybody up online. would never do it. Got to meet you. Got to make it to your class first. Got to look at you, see if you're able to listen, learn, and pay attention for an hour and want to be here before I'll even sign you up. Well, the, the beauty but, with communication is you only have to use the methods that get you where you need to go I, I i could learn greek but if i don't have anybody yeah. to speak greek to what's the you know yeah she my priority isn't making money like some people say, my priority is not making money my pr- priority is teaching martial arts and giving good service and then the money comes it works that way i provide a service and i do it i don't just send out like i know these guys that send out these emails and blanket and get all these people and have forms. You can sign up right online to your credit card. I would never sign anybody up like that. It's old school. I put out a product. I put out students. I have nobody under 16 in here wearing a black belt. You know, that's a silliness, in my opinion. Well, let, let's talk about that. That's kind of a hot-button issue in the martial arts. Well, most we can start. I got your little thing right here, 1 through 13 in front of me. You want to go down it in that order or any nope. way you want to do it? No, I mean, well, I expect we're going to hit all that stuff. Okay, but when I when, just want to have some kind of synopsis or some focus on points, so we don't go adrift. That's all. Actually, I love when we go adrift. That's where the best stuff is. <laughs> the only <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite sayings, and the listeners have heard this, is the best stuff is on the edges. The reason yeah. we provide the framework is if one of us, you know, isn't isn't getting where we need to go, that gives us a place to fall back to. And nine where, times where, it, where does this go anyway? You're on, you say martial arts radio. I've never heard of such a thing. So it's a, that is the title of our podcast. Okay. I've never seen a podcast, but go ahead. Um, so we post it on our website and it goes on YouTube and it just, it kind of, yeah, I've never been on, I don't go on YouTube and I don't go on uh, any, I've never taken a picture of my hamburger and put it on, upload it and show everybody what I got that you don't got. Up. <laughs> and when we go to dinner with a uh, guest of mine and, I go with a doctor and a dentist and his wife and my wife, and we go to dinner. It's just no phones, no phones. Don't bring your phones. Don't bring your phones into my restaurant. We're going to a restaurant. Leave them in your car. Mine's at home because I have no calls I need to make while I'm at dinner tonight. I don't need to take a picture of my lobster. I don't need to do it. <laughs> and you think I'm kidding. I'm no, I don't think you're attack. kidding. I, I completely yeah. understand. And it's what I'm laughing at is the... Yeah. If I'm going to dinner, I don't want your phone out of my dinner place. I'm right. sorry. 
No, no, for an no. hour and a half, let's have a conversation like adults. What's funny about it to me is that because it's been such a slow creep, there are plenty of people who aren't going to see it that way. But if you really, if you take a step back, if you think about it in the context of even 10 years ago, that's exactly what it would have been. It would have been so bizarre for someone to, I mean, nobody ever brought, you know, a film camera to dinner and took a picture of their meal. But you know what? Here's 10 years ago, it was rude. It's rude today. If you go to a fine restaurant, you go out to Norman's at the Ritz Carlton or Eddie V. Somebody, you don't take pictures of your picture. You, you just don't do that. You just don't do that. It's rude. It's rude. It's inconsiderate for the people next to you. Everybody else trying to have a quiet dinner and all that. To me, it's just rude. It's like wearing a hat indoors. I would never wear a hat indoors to a restaurant. That's just the way I was raised. Just don't do it. I don't blow my nose at the table. If I have a cold, I leave, excuse myself, go to the restroom, blows my nose. And now that's when it drives up, me come crazy. Back. No, worse than that is uh, people letting their little kids run around because they think it's their house. If you're over at Perkins and they're running up and down the, uh, the aisle and coming over and bugging me, you know, tame your child. <laughs> <laughs> then I is, give him a card. Is it, <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it fair to say, just based on... The last couple minutes that you are, are a man who doesn't pull punches in the figurative well, sense. Probably. Okay. Good. It all depends on who you're talking to. You know. <laughs> you know. So, so let's go. Let's go back to that that question. Sixteen year old black belts. Sixteen year old black belts. You talking about my system? What I did here? You mean? Yeah. Yeah. You you made a pretty strong statement that you don't have any black belts under sixteen years old. Well, I. I started when I was 22 years of age. I didn't start at five like the dude in Iowa. When I started, uh, January 1973, um, there were no kids in martial arts. There were no safety pads out there. June Reed didn't come out with safety kick, safety chop uh, yet. And along the way, uh, probably 10 years ago, I did a demonstration with Grandmaster June Reed at, uh, at Disney. But uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. When I started, I started in judo, Hideo Sugita. And my uh, karate teacher was the great Mike Foster. Yoshikai and his teacher, Mamoru Yamamoto. I didn't know I was among legends. I'm a little white belt. I got a picture with, uh, you know, Soki and, and, uh, and Han Chi. And, uh, and uh, Sugita was the All Japan Open uh, Judo champion at the time. And for a Japanese guy, he's pretty big. He was you know, 5'10, 185. I was probably weighing 155. And, you know, he could body slam me. He was boom. My judo wasn't fun to start with, I'll tell you. But I was doing a Yoshikai karate. I got my first belt in summer camp over in uh, uh, Daytona Beach from Mike Foster's Dojo. It's where you sleep on the floor in your gi with a sleeping bag for three days. And we'd run over uh, the uh, uh, the Daytona to Daytona Beach uh, over the inlet, over the bridge, down to the water at six in the morning. And uh, all the other people were doing katas at sunrise. I was so new. Uh, Back then, it was just white, green, brown, black. You go a year as a white belt. They did uh, break it into four belts for kids who all want everything now. You just go forever. So we were knee-deep in the ocean fighting uh, people. I beat five guys in a row and because uh, I had a chip on my shoulder. And Mike Foster, uh, he's a fighter. He, he caught us great with him. He just wants you to fight. So uh, I got to ride back in the back of the truck, and two people were promoted at camp out of that whole group. One guy got a black belt. I got my green belt. <laughs> and I came back to my instructor, Hideo Sugita, too soon, too soon, and took my belt away. And me not knowing anything about martial arts, uh, I should have just gave it to him, you know what I mean? And, and said, okay, whenever you think I'm ready. But I didn't know, so I went and started training with uh, Bill Akori and Goju Karate. And uh, the only true sensei in Central Florida back in the day was Mike Foster. And Bill LaCroix of uh, USA Goju, who was from New York, he trained under uh, Peter Urban, who trained with Gogan uh, Yamaguchi, the cat, who trained with Choji Miyagi, the founder of uh, Goju Karate in the world. So I got to be three or four from the top lineage. I didn't even know I was training with a great back then. Mm. And I used to go to tournaments with him and Goju and, and what have you, and he took me as a green belt, what have you. Then I went to a tournament with him and saw people fighting at the Davis Armory up here in Orlando. And I saw these guys with this patch on, just beating everybody's butt. And it was called uh, Olympic Karate Association. It was actually ITF Taekwondo. It was Wayne Lawrence. 
And uh, I went over, started training with him, and and uh, went on to get my uh, blue belt, brown belt there, and what have you. I was a teacher at that school and doing tournaments. And uh, one of my instructors there, uh, Roland Tinkus, who was a Sifu and uh, Kung Fu under Cham Poi, and uh, was a black belt in Taekwondo, and he you know, trained me how to fight. So I was a green belt for like five years, and he and I were, because I trained, what, three different styles already? And uh, we traveled all over the state just to fight. And that's back when I didn't care. All I did was lift weights. And uh, I, my day job, I ran a, a health club. And then I had a membership to a meathead gym. And then I uh, I, I taught Taekwondo at night. And uh, that's all I wanted to do was fight back there. 20, what, 22, 23, 24, 25. And that's when you're at your prime. But uh, that's that's how I got started. Along the way, I got into sheet the Roo, and I've been uh, doing sheet the Roo and karate all together for 45 years uh, now. So I got my black belt uh, level in Yoshikai, and black belt level in Goju, and, and then a, a sixth dan in uh, Taekwondo, and a seventh dan in uh, sheet the Roo. And um, that's what we teach here at the school to this day. But I started, what, January 6, 1973. I just didn't know any better, but uh, I met I met my wife along the way, and uh, I wanted to learn how to dance. My parents were ballroom competitor dancers, and I wanted to. I'd had some dance when I was young, but I wanted to learn how to dance. And uh, that's when the disc era was out. And I wanted to go out and dance with everybody, like everybody else. And I went to their studio. Ended up uh, marrying my dance teacher, and she was the United States Latin ballroom professional. And uh, I that. Top, uh, she and her partner were the top dance team in the United States at the time. I didn't know. And uh, it was like driving a Cadillac whenever we go out dancing. It was like stealing. So I got rid of my uh, one of my jobs. I was doing construction and just did dance and uh, martial arts and uh, made a career out of it. We ended up selling our house uh, after we put a company together here in Central Florida at Church Street Station. We moved to Vegas. We danced out of Vegas. And uh, we worked at all the casinos back in Oh, my God, the early 80s, that's back when it was still uh, family-owned, so to speak. And uh, it was two-lane highway there, and that's back when the Sahara and Riviera and the Sands and Silver Slipper and the Landmark. We danced at all those casinos. We used to open for Frank Sinatra, Robert Goulet, Angela Beaufil at the Hilton and stuff like that. Then we went to Europe, and uh, we were casino in Seville in Portugal and worked for Julio Iglesias. Uh, and uh, with a Bill Lloyd Ballet there. And uh, we came back to Florida, and I retired, actually. from. I was doing martial arts all that time, all that time, all that time. I was taking three or four classes a week. And uh, so it, it came to a point that uh, I, I had to make a decision. But I, was, I had to retire from dance in 86. I couldn't do it anymore. Two shows a night, six nights a week in Vegas, two shows a night in Europe, seven nights a week. Portugal with a third show on Sunday. I probably got down to a 29 inch waist for my 30, you know, and uh, the, all you did was eat protein there, fish and steak and eggs. And there's just no junk. There's no Pizza Hut, you know, it's just, uh, so you just work and uh, came back to the States and uh, I basically uh, didn't know what to do and I uh, went to work back at health clubs again where I started because I knew how to do that. And I ran the Bally Health Clubs here in Central Florida as general manager, sales manager. At each one of them, they'd move me around between the four of them. And my wife worked there, too, as well. And uh, I actually taught her uh, karate, and she taught me dance. And I was still going to karate four days a week, taking classes. And I shook hands and quit on six figures. I just got tired. I made it to the top at Bally, and I, I just didn't want to be there anymore. So uh, I love doing martial arts. And I... Sold everything I had, both my cars, my motorcycle, my boat, and bought one car, a new one, and we carpooled, took a second mortgage in my house, and built out a karate school, and we're still here to this day. And uh, I got a 7,000-square-foot, uh, well, we have a 15,000-square-foot building, but I have a 7,000-square-feet up front as our, our school. But uh, my wife got into martial arts. She teaches. And she's a... Uh, Degree black belt as well. She didn't get into it for the rank or what have you, but she competed here in Florida with me because I was a dancer in Vegas. I don't have great uh, martial arts fight uh, stories like all the people I train with. Uh, I mean, I used to train with Calvin Thomas. He was a NASCAR point champion and what have you. And 
I don't have it because you see when I'm dancing, I got to go on stage. I can't go out there with a broken hand or a broken eye or a broken lip or something. I had to go on. So I would compete in kata and weapon. And uh, when I was in Vegas in 83, 83, 82, 83, I was state champion in weapons and breaking. No, in kata and forms and breaking in 83. So I won the Nevada State Championship during 83 doing that. And in Florida, I started competing again in, what, 94, 5, 6, 7, 8. It was four times state champion in Florida in forms and weapons. I could go out and just, we're dancing. We're dancing. If I get hurt, we're, we don't work. We don't eat. And uh, so I don't, my fight uh, stories aren't on the tournament floor like Billy Wallace and played golf with him and all the other people that are great fighters out there. I read about them all along. Um, mine were on the street. I was a bouncer along the way at a nightclub and, and uh, all mine ended up either at Denny's at two in the morning after dancing all night. <laughs> It would be going to a restaurant in the morning and and, and uh, getting in uh, trouble in there and stuff like that where my fights actually have more reality-based martial arts as working in nightclubs. Tell us about that. There are, there's too many fights. There's just too many fights. There's just too many fights. Uh, when I worked at, uh, at this nightclub uh, the, uh, on the trail here in Orlando, the, the front room was the Las Vegas showroom, and I uh, had a singer and... and, and beautiful girls and the band. I mean, it wasn't naked or anything. It was like a Las Vegas showroom and dinner and what have you. The back was a, a strip bar with pool tables and hardcore and the bikers ran their girls through there and, and drugs through the back. You can't, you don't cross the bikers. I don't even mention the, the gang because I know who they are. And uh, I never crossed them because you can't win. Never fight a battle. You can't win. It's just crazy. Uh, That's in the book, uh, The Art of War back another day, but you still couldn't come back and beat those bikers. So every time there's a fight jump off, I was always uh, 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 fighting in there and making sure, because I knew everybody, I knew these guys, I made sure I was on their side. And then the owner saw me fight, and he hired me to work for a lousy five bucks an hour, I think in 74, I think it was, 74, 75. And uh, uh, I just remember there's many fights, two or three a week, but one stands out in my mind uh, where I learned about uh, uh, thinking before you start a fight. I'm in the back room. Somebody's flipping uh, bottle caps at the, the, the girls while they're up there. And I asked this guy to leave. And he stood up. He's drunk. He's probably weighing uh, 230, 240. Looked like Humpty Dumpty. And I said, oh, my God. And then I grabbed by the arm and said, let's go. He snatched it back, took a swing at me. I blocked it. I just put him in a bent over headlock. Uh, you know, I had him bent over from the waist, and I had him in a garrot under his throat. And I'm, this is, there's no kicking, okay, guys? All your taekwondo is useless on a bar. A any kind of high kicks or anything? We're talking uh, elbow to elbow, crowded back there. And I'm trying to drag this guy out, and I'm having to wear a sport coat because this is supposed to be a nice uh, 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 club, what have you. I had a flexible athletic sport coat because I, then I was a 40 top and a 30 bottom. And I had a pop-off tie. I was smart enough on that. But I didn't take my sport coat off before I went in the back. And uh, it was like fighting in a straight jacket. And so I got this guy. I'm dragging him to the front door in between people. Everybody's still drinking and party. They don't care. And then I didn't realize his little brother, which I didn't know at the time, had jumped over from behind and jumped on my back. And I had like this animal on my back had me in a choker. So I just tucked my chin so it couldn't choke me out. And I drug him out with his brother on my back. about. 50, 60, 70 feet to the front door and to there, and then I could release his brother, and then I could kick him, and then I just flipped this other guy over my back on the floor, pancaked him, and uh, Bobby and me, the other doorman there, basically took him out. It was done. But now the owner and the bar back, Bobby with a blackjack, which is leather-loaded uh, lead, I think it's illegal, they beat these guys mercifully. I mean, they weren't even fighting, and it threw him out the door. And then about a two weeks later, if they got back out of the hospital, I wasn't working the front door that night. Bobby was, and the other doorman, and they came in with a piece of rebar and cracked him across the skull, broke his skull, went to the hospital. He's never been the same since. I quit. It's not worth $5 an hour. If we're you hire us to take these guys out, then after we beat them up, then you guys kick them when they're down and stuff like that, that's, that's, not, that's not right. So I quit that job, but I got lots of fights like that. It's crazy like that. Denny's at 2 in the morning. Uh, it's just 
crazy. Go there after dancing all night. Uh, we were dressed nice back then. If you remember the old disco days, we were wearing sport coats and pullover shirts. And, and uh, I'm at Denny's at uh, maybe one thirty, two o'clock in the morning. And, and uh, we go, and that's when people still smoked in the restaurants, but they had special rooms for it. So we started going to the back room. There was this family back there, evidently, which I didn't know at the time. And I walked back in there, and I'm going, <laughs> I don't smoke. I couldn't breathe. This night eating here stinks. So evidently, this was a big family, a Hispanic family. And they came all out and all gathered around. And uh, the father, who I thought was an older guy, it, this was older, he said his 40s, because I was like, what, 27, 28, I don't know, uh, came up, put his hand in my throat, and just threatened me and all those big sons and what have you right behind him. And I think I can take this guy out so many ways in one second. But as soon as I do that, I'm jumped. So I pushed him away and did, I punched the guy behind him on the left, punched the guy on the right, and uh, the fight was on. And I'm with another guy in there, and, and, and we fought eight guys in that Denny's at 2 in the morning. And it looks funny on TV where people are throwing things and barroom fights, but those are fake things. The toughest person in that fight was the uh, daughter, and she's yelling in Spanish. She threw a wood high chair at, at us and hit a people sit down, and then you threw a glass of milk. I mean, that'll scar you. That'll crack your face. And uh, so that was uh, that was a hell of a battle that the rest of my friends showed up with a black Cadillac out front. There was five sheriff cars coming down Lee Road. They said, get out of here. They threw us back in the Cadillac, and we got <laughs> and we got away. And then I think about three days later, I have a sheriff come to my house. Supposedly, these people made a complaint because I beat a couple of them up really bad or what have you. Really? There were eight of them. There were eight of them, and I went to the police department, swore out a complaint against them, and never went anywhere. But I mean, there's just too many of that crazy stuff back then, and uh, I let it all roll off my back. Now, no road rage, nothing. Everybody live in harmony, and and uh, share a coke. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, it. I'm 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 lucky to be alive. I was at a pop festival in Celebration of Life in Louisiana, 1969. This is before karate. If I had known any martial arts then, uh, I would have been killed because I, I, I'd have probably thought I could have done something. Three bikers are asking for my ticket, and we'd snuck into the celebration of life. And uh, and I said, who are you? I didn't know they were running ramrod on like the Hells Angels did in California. This was another group called the Galloping Goose. And, uh, and they surrounded us, and uh, he, this guy pulled out a gun, put it right in my head, and the other guy sucker punched me, knocked my front teeth out, threw me in the back of a truck, started driving off to the... Uh, the thousands of acres back there, and I already knew four people had been killed at that pop festival. I said, this isn't right. I can smell the beer. I jumped out of the back of that moving truck at about 15, 20 miles an hour and ran back to the 400,000 people who were there. And uh, uh, just put myself in a lot of stupid positions growing up, a lot of stupid positions. I'm lucky to be alive. I, I really am. And, and the clubs and nightclubs and stupid stuff. Yeah, you know, some people learn late in life and grow up later, but uh, like I said, I didn't start martial arts until I was 22. It's been an anchor for me. I'm, I'm, I'll be 69 in September. I'm doing 45, 46 years. I don't know. How do you think your life would have been different if you'd started earlier? You've, you've mentioned that a couple of times that you started life, started martial arts. Uh, it would have started earlier because there was no martial arts around when I was younger. Well, it was, let's, there let's, pretend there, let's pretend there was. Let's you know, let's let's take an alternate Our, I, timeline through the. It's hard to universe. say. Okay. Jeremy, it'd be hard to say. I, I can't second guess how it is. I know this. There's a great song. Uh, I forget who does it. God bless the broken road that led me straight to you. You know, our lives all... Uh, I've done a lot of stupid things in my life, and uh, maybe you have too. I don't know. But you know what? Whatever I did led me to my wife. And had anything else been changed, I might not have met Jody. We've been married 40 years. Okay, we've worked together all those years in the karate at Bally. She was a uh, division manager. I was general manager. And we were a dance team, an adagio team, a lift team, sort of like you see with um, the Olympic ice skaters, okay, that do all the tricks, the pairs, just like that, but without the skates. That's the level we were at. And uh, so I, I would have met her, and, uh, you know, uh, we have this uh, great career because I got no children and. And we've been working together for 40 years. I mean, we own everything, Scott, free our home, all our vehicles, our RV, and, you know, we have investments and what have you. I've actually sold the school that I'm sitting in right now to 
my operations manager, Chris Maltz, and he's a uh, fifth Dan Sheehan now under me, and uh, the guy that answered the phone, and uh, he's been with me since he's 11, he's 36, and, uh, you know, he's got the school. I just uh, keep a 400-square-foot a office in here and work and work my uh, program out of here for martial arts school owners nationwide. Um, I teach in here maybe twice a week to adult classes on Tuesday and Thursday night because I like it. It's hour and a half classes. But uh, I, because I enjoy it, I don't have to. I have seven, eight uh, black belt teachers on staff here. But uh, it's basically uh, Chris's school now, but uh, uh, it's just it was so expensive. I'm order financing it for him. It'll take uh, three more years to pay it off. And I'm making sure that uh, he's able to, uh, I can wean him and where he can do all this, what I do, the marketing and sales and developing uh, uh, people that can take my place here. I haven't taught the kids here in 10, 15 years. Uh, we have we run a really large after-school program. That's the actual program I developed uh, here and nationwide, the Transport After School Martial Arts Program. We've been doing that for, what, since 1991? So about 26, 27 years. And that's what I do now. I just enlighten uh, martial arts uh, uh, school owners that call me every day from all over the state. I've had 1,500 people. 1,500 school owners that I know of throughout the United States, Canada, and United Kingdom. We're in Alaska and Hawaii uh, and showing other martial arts school owners how to uh, set up a transport after school martial arts program. We have BJJ, Kung Fu, Taekwondo, Karate, it doesn't matter. It's just how to structure it and do it right. It's a constructive alternative to child care. My program's a necessity. Uh, all martial arts schools, including this one, uh, the evening program is a luxury. And when times get tough, like in 2008, 2009, I think there were about 2,000 schools that went belly up in the United States that didn't have a, an after-school program. It's life insurance for schools. So even if you're laid off, if you're, if one of you is working or what have you, and you're looking for a job, and your kids are still going to school and need a place to go after school, your uh, options are extended day of school in the cafeteria, throwing spoons, uh, daycare with little ones with diapers, uh, you got an eight, ten-year-old boy in there with his little ones, or a uh, baby sitting at home, or latchkey. Uh, so, uh, if you weren't, uh, if you had lost your job uh, completely, you still were working. Your kids still had to be somewhere after school. It's life insurance for school owners, and that's why I'm so successful financially. Is, is I run a big school program here. I mean, we've run as high as 172 kids in our after-school program here, yeah, but. Uh, uh, we have seven vehicles. Uh, we own our own transportation company, and I use outside professional drivers, uh, Orange County, Seminole County school drivers, instead of my staff. My staff are black belts are teachers. My drivers are drivers. My operations manager manages the school. So everybody's good at what they do. I do the front end, sales and marketing, and all that. Now Chris has taken over all of it. Basically, the, he's been running the school for me all these years. I've had a great life. Uh, the last 10, 15 years, I play golf. I come in just several times a week. I've been going RVing and what have you because he enabled me to have a, a great life. But I developed my staff. I surround myself with people. Uh, when I was in college studying business, I knew I hated it <laughs> with accounting. So I have a great accountant. I have a good attorney. You know, I have a good manager. And I surround myself with people uh, that can do things better than me. Like I was telling you all the things I don't do. I do it through, that, through choice. I can text. I don't want to text. I don't want to text. It's just crazy. It's like going back in time to the Flintstones with a little bird pecking out a thing on a tablet and flying it to you. Why not pick up the frickin' phone? It's sad. I got people that email me, how much is your after-school program? Send me prices. I'm not separate. What? Excuse me. Uh, dear Anonymous, please simply pick up the phone and call me. I'll be happy to help you. I'll tell you features, benefits, and price right over the phone. Two out of ten will do it. Because they're all used to growing up without communication skills with other people. And they don't want to get down into trenches with a bayonet. They want to bomb from 50,000 uh, feet up. and They just don't want to converse with people. I want to unpack try. that for, for a bit. Because huh? as, as someone who's been teaching, involved in martial arts for a long time, you mm -hmm. know, we're, you've, you've seen a transition not only in the world and in people, but in martial mm -hmm. arts. And not only have you seen a transition in the way martial arts is presented, you've been responsible for some of that. So you mentioned someone emails you and asks for prices. 
most right. people are going to write back 100% of the time with the information that the customer needs right. to make their decision. And you're saying only you, you write yeah. back and say no. I'm going no, to you. No. No, and I'm only talk 20% to you. will actually call you. Right. Why? Why do you do that? Why? Because they grew up texting, living on a phone, and don't have commutation communication skills. They don't want to talk to somebody that might be a salesperson that they don't really want to know, or it's another school shopping or what have you. But it's usually the first one, not the latter, is they just don't want to get involved. They just want you to, here, just send me some. It's like my staff now. They Uber their freaking lunch. Okay, they go and Uber eat, and they and they call someplace, have Uber bring them their lunch. I just made my lunch today. I brought it with me here. I went by Publix and got some boar's head ham and cheese and made myself a lunch with some cherries for dessert. And uh, I'm a different generation. I, 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 I don't need to piss away money. And, and plus, uh, I, I just it doesn't work for me. It just doesn't work for me. I want to talk to somebody. Here's why. Here's why. Okay. Jane uh, said, please just send me all the info uh, on your program. But, okay. So I said, you what? Nine ninety five. Is that a good number? No. You need to. You don't sell on price, and if you do, shame on you. You don't buy anything like that. I drive a Mercedes. I didn't buy it on price. I bought it for the features: the AMG engine, yada yada, heated massage seats, yeah, all those things in it. Uh, I don't buy it for price is important, but that's not why I buy something, and that's not why people buy something for a price. If if you really think about it, yeah. Well, somebody's coming online and they're uh, they're asking me how much. Uh, is your just just you know, just just send me all the info to prices? They don't even want to talk to a human. I don't roll that way because I want to ask you first of all, how many kids do you have? A, B, how old are they? C, do they have any prior martial arts experience? D, what's your interest in coming to our school? What are you hoping uh, to get out of it? Okay, are your kids off the wall? You want us to fix your kids with structure and discipline? I mean, they might be ADHD, ODD, PDD. Uh, Asperger's, all that. I need to know all that if they have any uh, learning disabilities or take medications or if they've been kicked out of six daycares now you're calling me. That's why I don't sign people up online. I need to talk to you about that. First of all, I want to know what school they go to, see if it's even in my service area or we're wasting our time anyway. Okay? So I'm going to tell them features and benefits and then I'll tell them price of all my programs right over the phone. But I'm going to ask you those questions first. Qualifying questions. If First of all, we're going to even go to that school and pick up. We pick up 20 schools, okay? But you might be in South Orlando and just got me on Google or something, and I'm wasting five, ten minutes with you, uh, uh, typing to you or talking to you, and we're not going to be able to service you anyway. And, and then you're talking about the after-school program, but you might be a stay-at-home mom that don't need the after-school program anyway. You would be in my evening program because I don't co-mingle those two. The after-school program. Uh, we run between 150, 170 kids here after school, uh, uh, depending. And and I don't uh, put my evening students or traditional students or term students, six month and one year students, in my after school program. That's uh, dedicated just for after school. Those people are paid three to six times the evening program in every state. So uh, they're paying three times my monthly rate for after school and six times my monthly rate for summer camp. So that's valuable real estate out there, okay? And they're here five days a week. It's a better student. I don't care what you're teaching, dance, gymnastics, martial arts, if you're doing it five days a week, an hour each day, you're going to have uh, superior students. That's why this school was named top competition school in the state of Florida back when we were competing because it took 32 kids and my wife and myself around the state of Florida, and we competed about 15 tournaments a year on the fame circuit, then later on the kick circuit, and we just, uh, we just, Outperformed everybody. Not because I'm that great. Uh, uh, is is basically because we outworked everybody. But I competed myself. And I know what it takes to win, and I uh, I know what it takes to judge. And I I have a dance background. I teach technically. I have a ballet bar here at my school. Instead of doing tendus, releves, batons, arabesques, we're doing kicks at four counts and one kick, front kick, side kick, round kicks. And I work with people on kick lines, foot blades, and stuff like that. I've got two junior black belts over here last night from a Shotokan school, which is a sister of Shitharu, and they never heard the word foot blade in their life. Their kick lines are awful. Okay, they move real great. They're very respectful, have a lot of good things, but they don't have basic technique. I don't care what style you teach. There's an alphabet for every one of them. They're made up of blocks, punches, kicks, and stances. All styles are. And you have to, all forms, all kata 
are made up of blocks, punches, kicks, and stances. And if you don't have basic good alphabet, good school figures, then how do you think that you're going to group those together in, in, in a kata or a form and, and, uh, and it's going to be any better because it's made up of those. So I break it down uh, just like my dance instructor did, come up on top of me and, and tuck my butt under and make my center line come up and, and all that. It makes sense to me. So I have a ballet bar up in here. Uh, and I'm making everybody do their kicks with foot blades. And I look at their kick lines. It's all lined up. It's, everything is made up of that. Everything is made up of that. It's like teaching kata without bunkai. That's like a treasure chest without a key. That's why people don't like kata, because they don't understand it. They're just moving around. It's good exercise by itself. It helps you turn and move and punch and block and kick. It's good rope memory. But there's fighting techniques passed down, whether it's taekwondo or karate within the forms. And if you bunkai them, then it's like a light bulb goes off. And you say, oh, that's what Pidan Yandan is. Or that's what Basai Dai is. I never knew that. No kidding. You're not going to know it unless somebody shows it to you. So... There's another hot button issue. What? Forms and, and, and whether they... Well, it depends. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there are schools out there that will brag that they no longer teach kata or, or forms, depending on your, you know, your, your All right. language it's choice. It's okay. It works, if it works for them, that's great. You can cut them out and just do uh, uh, street fighting. That's good. And you can just do uh, tournament sparring. Dude, tournament sparring is a game. It's a sport. There's no... There's a referee there. There's rules. There's no mommy. Fighting's for real. I know. I was on the street. I know what fighting is, okay? Never wear a jacket to a fight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, can, I can still remember that to this day. I, it's like I bowed up, and I, 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 was, I was really in good shape then. I had like a 43-inch lat spread, and, and I had a 30-inch waist, and I had this athletic jacket on, right? It moved a little bit. But when you fight, it's, it was a straight jacket. So I learned a valuable rule that I survived that fight. I never got hit once. I never got hit once between the two of them, and, and that's what I take away from that fight. I, it wasn't 10 to 2, 5 to 3, he broke my nose, blackened my eye, but I knocked him out. No, it was, it was like 10 to 0, and that's how I like my fights. I don't like getting hit. Uh, I've been clawed, and I've been maced, but I, 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 I never got beat up other than that time at gunpoint in Louisiana. <laughs> but, I mean, I hear click, click, or I look at him, but then I get sucker punched right in the mouth. You know, wow. but, uh, did that incident but forms, with... forms, forms are good exercise. First of all. Okay. You can look at them just by themselves. It's just uh, like jumping jacks, right? If you do forms, Oh, you do each form three times, three times, do each form and move on. There's 52 kata in Shituru karate. I only do 35 of them myself, but, uh, the trick to it is to take fighting techniques out of those kata. That's bunkai. That's the application. If you're teaching that, then it makes sense to your student. If you're not, it doesn't make sense. And the reason a lot of people don't do forms anymore is because that teacher never learned bunkai. Their teacher never taught them the application of those forms. To them, it's like dance. And if you're just doing movement, that's dance. And I was a professional dancer for nine years. Okay, I know what that is. We had a dance company here, and we traveled and performed everywhere. Dancing is great. But if you're doing kata like that, you're dancing. If you're not showing applications, uh, what these moves are, then you're dancing. And what happens is when you do take the time to learn it yourself and then teach it to your students, you actually teach them the kata. You don't know a kata until you can, one, know where it originated, who formulated it, okay? And what the interpretation is uh, in, in, from Japanese to English or from Korean to English, what it means, okay? And where it was formulated. And two, you got to be able to f- perform it, perform it well. And number three, you need to be able to break it down and teach the bunkai the application of those moves, or you never really learn the kata. You're dancing. And that's nothing wrong with that. So if the guys I think that are dropping it is because they don't understand it themselves and don't know the application and don't know how to teach it, so they just knock it out. They just want to fight. So they skip. It's okay. Just skip them and go straight to fighting. That's okay. Just teach sparring drills and fighting drills. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I used to I uh, kind of put my nose up because I'm a traditionalist at the at the uh, extreme martial arts. Uh, I call it exhibition martial arts and all that. But you know what? It, they're very, very talented, and, and, and I watch people do that, and, and the musical kata, the musical forms. It's not what I do, but I really appreciate the talent and skills and the athleticism in it. I know Mike Chat and uh, 
uh, I've seen it, and I really appreciate it. I have a whole different view on it these days. And I, I've watched them do weapons and all that. I'm a traditionalist. I tell people, go online, look at the world championships in, in uh, Paris, like 2012, 13, 14. 13. Look, look at what wins there. Look at the Japanese female kata team, and, and when they'll do a group kata, and if that doesn't turn you on, then I think you're in the wrong sport. And then watch them do the bunkai at the end of their kata. If that doesn't amaze you, then then karate is not for you. It just isn't. Uh, I, I watch them do weapons. When I teach, I was state champion weapons. I, every move I do with my bow, every move I do with my tafa has bunkai, has application. We do bow, tafa side, nuchaku, and kama knife in the school. And we do bow to bow kumite. We do bow to tafa kumite. We do bow to side kumite. All the block strikes, all are done. We break it down and teach it. Now it makes sense. It's real application. If you just spit in your bow like a baton twirler and all that, I'm just going to do a lunge and jab you right in the throat <laughs> with my bow while you're spitting yours like a baton twirler. But I look at the athleticism and the ability of being able to spin a bow like that and do all those things. They can obviously do the basics with it too. But we, we're in the block, parry, strike. We, we waste no movement. Every movement we do has application. So uh, that's just how my take on it. And I like to see the traditional martial arts done at the highest level. And I always tell people, look at the world championships. Get on your, your YouTube and what have you and, and, and look at it at, at, in, in Paris and, and watch how those people do uh, forms. Watch your traditionalists fight. We still do hook kicks to the head and, and, and jump spinning back kicks. We still all do all that too. So... But I appreciate uh, uh, the extreme martial arts and, and all that as well. It's just, if that's uh, your way to get into martial arts, uh, that's wonderful. If that's what turns you on, that's great. And anybody that can do that advanced uh, type of forms, what have you, could uh, learn how to do the traditional stuff or maybe learn all the traditional stuff first and then took off to another level. It's all good. It's an interesting time because we have so many options, so many different styles, so many different yeah. ways of them being presented. And what I appreciate... It wasn't around when I started. It just wasn't sure, around. Sure, Well, actually, I want to my circle back to that. My chat wasn't born. <laughs> <laughs> I, want to come, okay. I want to come back to, to some of your experience coming up, because there was something you mentioned that was really different than what I've experienced, but I want to come back. But one of the things that I appreciate in what you're saying is that you're articulating, this is not my way. It's not what I want to do but I see the value in it. For me, it's not right. what I'm putting on you Absolutely. or your other people. What works for you is great. Okay? That is not Just some... like in the movies. Just like in the movies. When I watch uh, old movies, we all grew up watching Bruce Lee or David Carradine and Kung Fu. Or if you're old enough, you go back to Our Man Flint with uh, James Coburn where you do a little karate chop, come up behind a back guy, just a little chop it back, and the next fight was over. I said, whoa, that's so cool. That's before we even knew what karate was. No, I grew up uh, and all that stuff. But um, uh, when I watch uh, <laughs> those old movies, and then when I grew up and got older and started and taking it myself and looking at it, it, a lot of it's just silliness. When I watch those old fights from Enter the Dragon and Fist of Fury, you know, and when you, you kick it, as old as I am, if I kick you in the head, Jeremy, you're going unconscious, my friend, okay? <laughs> if I elbow you in the head, you're going out. Okay, I'm not gonna kick you 16 times in the head like Bruce Lee did. Hook kick, rock kick, hook round, hook round, hook round. Silly this. Kentucky Fried Movie did a great parody on it, where he's uh, a guy playing Bruce Lee beats up, you know, like starts beating up all these black belts running them, starts stacking them like cordwood. They're like 10 feet high, and then he hits a tank and cuts the tank in two. You know, that's my take on that. Uh, but I, I appreciate what he did for martial arts, but the movies made him into bigger than life than what he was. But that brought it all to a lot of us that got us involved in martial arts. That or David Carradine, who really wasn't in uh, martial arts. I met him in Las Vegas. It was David Chow doing all his fight scenes. Uh, but uh, that got us involved in it, whatever it takes to get you involved in it. But uh, what I look at a fight scene, I'm looking back, some of the stuff that I appreciated. Uh, one of them was, was a crouching dragon, hidden tiger, or vice crouching versa? Crouching tiger, hidden dragon, yep. I couldn't watch that movie. I watched a few, I says, you know, I can't watch fake. I'm sorry. I can't do it. I can't teach. I made 
I put out a hundred state champions, national champions, junior Olympic champions, but I never could teach my people to run up a wall and jump off a building or sway from trees to top them and fight people with swords. I said, this is absolutely obnoxious, ludicrous, even though I won, I think I won the, the uh, Oscar, I think. I said, I can't watch that. I watched a fight scene in one of the Steven Seagal's fights back in the day when, uh, when he was a little bit lighter and younger. And uh, uh, it's just, he was coming out of a bar fighting these guys. And I, I think it was Screwface or whatever. And he just does a, a little 45 degree side kick, which I teach my white belts going to the yellow belt to the knee. And then the fight was over. The guy said, you broke my effing leg. You broke my effing leg. He just walked by him. He just, bam, bam, two hits. The choreography was great. It was, it was slap, hit, bang, you're done. But it's not six-minute fight to the death and everybody's hitting each other 19 times in the head. You know, the fights just don't go there. I like reality. I just like reality stuff. Mm. You know, but I like watching all of them, from Jean-Claude and, and yeah. John Club and Nam and all of them great, but I don't like fake. I just don't like fake. It drives me crazy. I can't the that. epitome of that was that crouching uh, dragon, <laughs> crouching tiger, hidden dragon. Or whatever. That was the epitome of fake. Let's go back. I mentioned there was something else I wanted to bring up. You yeah. talked about in the seventies training in three schools at once. You were the first person I've ever heard of to talk about cross training in different styles at that time. I thought. You know, and, and forgive me, because I'm genuinely ignorant. My understanding of that time was not only was that not done, it was very heavily restricted that instructors would... You're work. correct. Okay. Can You're you talk correct. About that? So I didn't, make myself, I didn't make myself clear. I finished at one school. This is back... I got out of my house at 18, 19. I was working... I worked my own way through college. I bought my own car. There was no college from. My dad said, go down the street, turn right get a job. So I've worked since I was 13. I bought a motorcycle when I was 14 and drove it to school and had a job. I've always worked all my life. Nothing was ever given to me. So uh, uh, when I was in uh, uh, driving uh, uh, to college, I'd move. I'd live in an apartment on one part of Orlando. Then I'd move to another apartment, a part of Orlando. And I, I'm working in the health club industry back then and going to college at night. And I'm carrying like, I think, 12 hours and working about 60 hours a week and uh, trying to get ahead. Uh, so I had limited time. And so uh, the, 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 the Gojer school was on South Waters Blossom Trail, okay? And then uh, the Taekwondo school was in the Colonial Plaza Mall. And uh, so I, didn't tr- I wasn't training at the same time in those schools. I, I trained with Hideo Sugita for a while and left Yoshikai. And then I went uh, to Gojer. I was to build a quarry. For a while back in, my God, what, 76? I was back with him, I think, again in 86. Uh, but uh, uh, I, tr- I wasn't tr- at two different schools at the same time at any time. I was 100% at one school at a time and 100% at another school at a time. And for years, I was with the uh, 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 Wayne Lawrence and uh, Roland Tingus with the Olympic Karate. They had three schools. They were teaching uh, ITF Taekwondo. And... Uh, I can, we only went to open tournaments. We, there was no Koreans in town. There was no bibs. There was no, you can't punch the head. In Florida, I don't know if you know this uh, because of our age difference. Uh, in Florida, I think Texas too, groin was a point. You could kick to the groin, my friend. Okay? I heard that. That's a point. You didn't drop kick him, you know, you just drop, you just do a snap kick in there. You get that point, or it makes your hand go down if you're a man, and you just back fist him in the head. Okay, we were in a Taekwondo school. But, and when we did our forums, we did the high youngs, Chunji, Tonglin, To San Wan Yo, what have you. But when we fought, it was just open karate tournament rules. Okay, most of us didn't wear pants; they were they were just coming out, and most of us didn't do that. We wore, I wore a shit and instep, you know, a little cloth pullover shit instep, a cup and a mouth guard, and put white adhesive tape around my knuckles. And you could do a round kick at Rollins College on the gymnasium floor. You could catch that round kick, sweep the supporting leg, drop him and bounce him off that Harvard floor, and follow up with one second with a point, with a punch. You get a, a point for the sweep and a point for the punch. And groin was a point. And yes, you can punch to the face. We didn't go to any of the uh, 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 Taekwondo tournaments. I never even heard of a Taekwondo tournament back then. There were no uh, uh, Koreans in town. There was no WTF. We were ITF. International Taekwondo Federation, but uh, I didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. I, like I said, I'm learning, and uh, and I had good fighters. They were the best fighters 
the best fighters in Central Florida came out of Olympic karate. Oliver, Robbie Gooch, and used to win the, the uh, uh, and Ben Parker, and Roland Pincus, and, and all the people, all winning at the U.S. Open, the Open Tournament here in Orlando every year. These are fighters that, that are proven on the circuit. And uh, so I wanted to fight like them. My best fighting was back then, but I wasn't uh, uh, having to go on stage uh, and, and worried about fighting. I, I had to curtail my fighting experience along the way as my wife and I became successful, and that became our career. I I couldn't get, uh, as it was, <laughs> at my brown belt test, I did a spinning back kick, and this guy named Norm, I know his last name, he uh, he scooted in and just did a reverse punch, a tate ski to my kidney, and uh, uh, I continued fighting that day, but it stung like a bee, okay, not like a normal punch. And later that night, my wife and I went to a contest, a disco contest at the uh, 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 Park Avenue Disco. It was like uh, Studio 54 here in Orlando. And we won that contest. It was 500 bucks. So I, mean, I was planning to go to that. But I had testing that day. And when all the adrenaline wore off of that night, my back hurt so bad. I was peeing blood. He had displaced my kidney. And I told my wife I could go to the hospital. And she always saw me getting banged up, getting cut, and getting stitches, and all this stuff. She said, no, you don't have to go. Honey, I got to go to the hospital. I know when I got to go. I was in there for four days with an IV. It knocked my kidney. I didn't know so I didn't know what there was a thing such as a displaced I'd kidney. I'd never heard of knock that, it. No. I'd never heard of it either. You can knock your kidney. There's a little sack your kidney sits in, and you can knock it out. Okay, you can punch it right out of there, and you'll pee blood. Okay, and I, you know, uh, 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 they gave me a drug called Demerol. And uh, my God, that's the best thing they ever made. Just, <laughs> and then here's what's sad. I got out of there. I thought it was all better. About three weeks later, I'm working with Roland Tinkus, and he's a great sweeper. He did, he did a little scorpion sweep, if you know what that is. He would just drop to the ground and just swing his rear foot around. And it took me right off my feet. It went straight up in the air, probably had some hang time, and hit the ground on my butt. And right away, I could feel it come out of the – I could feel it. And Roland drove me to the hospital. We're in our geese. And uh, I think it was a brown belt at the time. And uh, I, I was really hurt, man, really hurt. And I was in the hospital again for about three or four days with displaced kidney. Nobody even hit me that time. He just swept me. And uh, I had, I'm telling you, I had hang time. I landed on my butt, and that kidney came right out of that socket again. So, uh, Let's talk a bit more about the after-school program. You know, we've 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 heard we've heard a ton about you today, and, and you know this this was a lot of fun because you made my job easy. I just got to stand back and listen to you. Well, but, that's what you wanted, so that's what that's, we did. That's right. That's right. Just hey, get out of the way, right? Let, let, let you do let you do your thing, and, and you did. And well, I read your form here, and it kind of basically went over some of the things over. You, it, you ticked almost all of the boxes. It was great. Yeah, love it. <laughs> But now, as far you know, as reading books, the only thing I ever read was a Tao G. Kondobo. I used to black. We used to read Black Belt magazine growing up. You probably did too, and probably Kung Fu Illustrated. Any, anything about karate? It was all yeah. magazines. There weren't many books out back then that we knew about. Just magazines. Yeah. You know, and when you went to seminars, uh, there's there's nothing online. There was no online. I grew up without computers. Okay, we had pay phones. Okay. Uh, uh, you would uh, be at a karate tournament, then as you'd leave, people would hand you flyers. There's a seminar coming up in six months, and Soki Blargin and uh, Soki Joseph Ruiz will be there or whatever. And, and then you know, it was 25 bucks, which was pretty good money back then. And we'd go to seminars like that. It was just word of mouth and flyers, and you'd go train. Now you can buy DVDs and, and videos and go online and learn from everybody. So it's really great. You can learn so much more now from great masters that you might not be able to travel to Japan. I met Morio Higiona. He came here. I trained with Morio Higiona. But, uh, uh, and some some great karate masters in the day, and, and, and Shogo Koniba, uh, who is, I would love to train with now. He died in 92. His son, Kozo Koniba, it's okay, came here to this school uh, several times to Japan. I flew him over, and he ranked me and all my black belts and made us jump through the hoops. But uh, let's continue with what you, you had a question about. Sure. Sure. What the after school program, which is the thing the that program. you know you're you're known for, is pioneering that. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are still plenty of schools that are looking at that and considering it as an option. There are still plenty of areas in the country where yep. after school martial arts programs really aren't done. They are uncommon. Versus, I'm going to assume 
especially around you because of the influence you've had, it is far more popular. How did you come up with that idea? Let's start there. Well, please, I'm not the first person to come up with that idea. I would bet there's somebody, you know, karate or martial arts is what, thousands of years old, Bodorama or what have you, and, and uh, Fudan province with the, the Chinese fist and all that, what have you, really old. Karate is only a couple hundred years old. Karate it used to be called uh, just Unante and Te uh, Okinawa from uh, uh, the Three Seas, Shuri and Tomari and uh, Naha and Okinawa and all karate started there and then came to Japan, basically. So it's really that at all. But I'll bet you probably 200 years ago, somebody was on an ox cart picking up kids from a school and taking them to somebody's house and backyard on a dirt floor like they do in uh, 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 Laos and, and, uh, and what have you. People are learning kickboxing and what have you, Muay Thai. Uh, they're, they're training in the backyard where their parents were in the fields working, okay? Somebody's watching all those kids. And I'll bet you somebody was doing that. Then. That's probably where it started. But uh, I didn't get their book. I didn't get their DVD. Uh, nobody there can tell me about the Department of Children and Families and exemptions. Uh, so uh, uh, I was with, uh, actually, Calvin Thomas, uh, and we got together in his little 1,200-square-foot dojo, about 900 square feet in there, and he actually was doing a little after-school program, so to speak, picking him up in his own Toyo van with no brakes, and my wife's uh, Lincoln, and uh, after running Valley Health Clubs and all this, I, I went in there, I said, this is not how to do this, okay? And within a month, I had 33 uh, 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 kids in there, the place was full, and then we moved and we opened uh, another place, 5,000 square feet, that we had a business divorce, and uh, I, I'm not into partners or what have you, and I don't believe he is either, but uh, it was a mutual business divorce, and I went my way. So he kind of had a, he just, they just picked up kids after school in his vehicle. There was no program to get or any way to do it. And back then, there was nothing. And it's 1990, 1991. And uh, uh, back then, I was the only guy around actually doing things professionally. Uh, just before I even wrote my first book, uh, I, I used to, in my first book, I said, he who has the higher ladder wins. I used to put my, <laughs> my after-school signs on telephone poles. And this before I learned about code enforcement. <laughs> But I, because a ballot, we used to have lead boxes. Now, lead boxes only work if you have a sales team, and they're not allowed to have any front-end traffic. They're not allowed to take walk-ins. They're not allowed to answer the phone. They have to make and develop their own uh, infos and referrals and what have you. That's what lead boxes are for. They're big. They're obtrusive. They get them in places. I have brochure racks in 30 businesses. I have brochure racks in uh, uh, over 20 schools, okay? I'm business partners for all the schools, okay? And I'm on their daycare provider list. Uh, my signs at their school. Uh, I, I'm in their school newspaper. Uh, so I, I'm in the schools. Well, I, I run on seven turbocharged cylinders because I am not on Facebook. I just read in MA Success Magazine, it was either 87 or 89% of all schools advertise on Facebook. I'm not. And I'm very successful. I'm where the piranha feed. I am at the schools. So when you come in, uh, the school, you walk in the office, my brochure rack's there. If you ask for a daycare provider list, what do they have after school other than their extended day? I'm number one on it, okay? If they have a school newspaper or PTA newsletter, I buy advertising in it. And on the way out, if the school permits, I have my sign on the way out of the school. So that's the king five right there. I have all that, but, uh, well, I don't have any ob uh, objection to being on Facebook, and we're going to do it as well, too. I just have never gotten to it. I'm basically uh, semi-retired now, if not retired. But I'm going to keep doing the after-school program. I wrote a book back then called Task Force, Transport After-School Karate. And that was my first book. It was in black and white with pictures, and I had a VHS ready to go with it. And I sold a gazillion of those back in the day to help people get started. And then I, uh, uh, I learned about the Department of Children and Families and codes and exemptions here in other states. And I've had hundreds of battles in other states helping clients get exempt because they're doing stuff they're not supposed to do, like Fun Friday, uh, where you don't have class. That's a euphemism for unlicensed child care on Friday. You can't do that in any state of the union. Okay, you just can't do that. You need to take class, whatever it is, whether it's dance, gymnastics, or martial arts, each and every day you're there, or you're providing child care. Just like if you have a parent's night out or a ninja night, and you accept money for that, that's the definition of child care. You can do it, but you can only charge for food and beverage and no fee for the actual watching the kids. These are little things that I know, okay? 
And a lot of people just have no ideas. I'm not a daycare. I'm a martial arts instructor. We teach. Listen, you can holler that, Jeremy, from Mount Everest, and it won't hold water. Okay? It doesn't matter. When you have X amount of other people's kids for Y amount of hours, there's rules and regulations to follow in every single state of the union. Everywhere. Here in Florida. You need to know the codes. Like Florida, 65C-22.008. Number C, there's six things you got to follow. We can't do field trips during the calendar school year. In other words, spring break, winter break, Martin Luther King Day, while kids are in school, you can't do field trips. People in Florida do it all the time. They're operating, uh, I would say the vast majority of schools in the United States that have an after-school program are operating illegally at this phone conversation. They're flying under the radar of the Department of Children and Families. That's what they're doing. And the Department of Children and Families say they're overworked, uh, uh, underpaid, understaffed so they don't get to everybody until there's a complaint made then by law they have to come in and check it out and that's when people call me in the 11th hour or the 12th hour like somebody called me from Missouri 20 years 20 years operating a, a type of after school program and then they were told to cease and desist I got involved I got a hold of the state it took me six weeks I got a written letter of exemption with my TASMA program on them and they're exempt I would much rather people start out correctly from the start and not ever uh, uh, poke the problem children and families and come in. In other words, it's easier to build a new house from scratch than to remodel a house that has uh, rats in the attic and termites in the basement. And it's just hard to do because they're, mm-hmm. you know, the transportation issues or the amount of hours that they're there, what are they doing before and after class? The problem and children and families love what we do. They love the martial arts that we're teaching kids. My first book was called The Task Force. After that, I wrote a program. It was called AMP. You might have heard of that. Uh, Grandmaster Y.K. Kim, who's not my instructor, we're not uh, martial arts peers. Uh, he's a marketer, and I traveled with him for four years around the United States and Canada and doing seminars. I learned how to do seminars from him. That's what I learned from him. He learned how to do the after-school martial arts program from me. I made a lot of money doing all that. Then we had a business divorce. I could still call him and talk to him and go to lunch with him. But he has his own program. We have a difference of opinion. The way I do it is week to week with no contract, okay? Because our market is daycare. It's extended day and babysitting. It's all week to week with no contract. There's no contract, Jeremy, in your school or my school. If you have a school that's going to hold somebody with you, if they want to leave, they're going to leave. And most people are not going to sue them for a lousy nine, twelve, fifteen hundred 12, 1500 bucks, whatever it is for a year or whatever it is. It's just not worth it. The only thing that's going to hold people to you is service. Okay, uh, giving them what they want for what they're paying for, and, and that's the only thing. It's customer service. So uh, uh, my program is week to week because our market is extended day of school and kinder care and stuff like that. It's all week to week. The difference is uh, with me. If you're not with me a week, you don't have to pay for a week to hold your spot for services not rented like a daycare. When you're out of school all day long for like in service days, like Martin Luther King Day, no extra charge all day long. Uh, if they get sick, they're only with me one or two days. Uh, uh, they'll have credit to the next week. Three days or more constitute a week. I don't sell partial days, partial weeks. I know people that kowtow to parents. They do whatever they want. You want them to do homework? I'll make sure he does his homework. Homework can't be part of your program in any state. Okay? It just can't be part of your program. It can be incidental to, okay, but not part of your program. You can't advertise it, market it, tutor it, or help with it. Unless you're a licensed child care or a tutor type. These are kind of things that I know of. Uh, You've articulated but, but, a, a number of a, a few things that you yeah. do, and we have a ton of school owners that are listening right now. So I'd love, you know, we're we're going to post the links to to your websites. Well, what it is now, the latest program I wrote is we didn't get to. It's called TASMA, Transport Out of School Martial Arts, and it's now in its fifth edition, and it can be uh, 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 looked at online at AfterSchoolKing.com. My school uh, website is KarateOnline.com. I don't have a fancy website because remember, I'm I'm not jiggy with it with all the videos and all the neat things and all that. But you know what? Uh, this little one school here, five days a week, we're not open on the weekends, okay? We have, are you ready for this? 12 classes a week, okay? And 15 with the summer. And we've grossed as high as 750 grand in this school in one year. We've never gotten below 600 grand in one year. And it's basically part time except for summer camp. And it's just the way we choose it. We could, I used to have 29 classes a week. I cut it back, and I, I actually make more money and work less. No weekends. 
<laughs> and uh, when I spoke in Las Vegas at the Super Show, when I was with Century for about five, six, seven years, I used to go to uh, the Super Show do a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I raised my hand up there. How many of you guys uh, like work on weekends? Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> and the school owners were there. Of course, they want their instructors there on the weekend. I said, but if you could be off on the weekend, would you like to have a couple hands with them? <laughs> and uh, who, nobody likes working weekends. You do what you got to do to get it going. I used to do it. Actually, I did. I was in tournaments, and Chris ran to school on weekends. That's why he now owns the school. But uh, you can do it my way and work less, make a heck of a lot more money. Uh, one of my uh, uh, people that helped me with this program and marketing, Tim McCann, he has an after-school program over in Tampa. He works from 2.30 to 6.30. All he does is after school, no weekends, no evening classes, nothing. He makes a great living. His whole family works there. So you can do it in it. You can put just 25 kids extra into your program, make another hundred grand a year, or you can make your program big like mine. Most people are 75% traditional, 25% after school. I'm just the opposite. I'm 75% uh, TASMA and 25% uh, evening students. I only have about 100 evening students. About you know 75 uh, kids at six and about 25 uh, adults at seven so, because I never promoted it. The money isn't there. If you're going to be a miner, if you're going to go dig, you can dig for coal, copper, silver, gold. I'd dig for diamonds. Yeah. I'd go to South Africa if I was going to be a miner. Might as well. All right, so we're going to drop those links at at the show notes, whistlekick com for anybody listening that might be new to the show. And if, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear, at least it is to me, if you have a martial arts school and you're not at least considering an after school program, here's a good time to think about it. We've talked a lot about that today. You've got some resources. It's life insurance, online. Jeremy. It's life insurance. It just is. And it was proven in 2008, 2009. The people that had after school programs stayed open, the people that did bellied up. Unless you had a really, really big school, you know, and cut back. So, you know, we all had to tighten. I had to tighten up here. I have a big after-school program. I, believe it. I mean, I got down to like 90 kids in after-school program. I was at 150, 160. So, you know, if you only had 15 after-school, you might have bellied up anyway. So I'm just saying, it's, that's that's where the future martial arts is. It's, it's a transported after. A lot of people have after-school, but they don't have a transported after-school martial arts program where you go get the kids. Or have your service go get the kids. We outsourced for 16 years to a transportation company. They worked for me, exclusively for me. Then I bought the company. I have my own transportation company. I keep it separate from my uh, my escort. It's a separate LLC for liability and uh, for other reasons. It's the way to do it, to separate church from state. And I don't want my instructors or me out stuff. I used to. I did it. I did everything. But uh, I have professional drivers now. And once you get to the level where I'm at, uh, and you do it professionally, I try to start people out from the start being professional, separate church from state. Uh, if you can, use outside drivers instead of your staff. If you can, try to keep everything completely uh, uh, separate. Keep your instructors as instructors and your managers as managers and your drivers as drivers. But it, 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 you can do it different ways. I, I've done it different ways myself. I even used my wife's uh, Lincoln back in the day in 1991, but we have four school buses and three 15-passenger vans. Wow. We have outside drivers. We use six of those vehicles, keep one in the rears for a breakdown, and then we use six outside professional drivers. There you go. So nobody here is out schlepping kids. And when you have a large amount of kids being dropped off, somebody has to be on the floor, right? That's right. When they're getting, right. And my kids are never out of control, ever. <laughs> I've had people come over here, martial arts, and look, they couldn't believe how controlled it is. I can't believe that you think that that's something because what are your kids doing? You know, how can I? Our kids aren't allowed to talk in the bus or the van. They're never out of their seats. They can whisper. If they hear you, if the bus driver hears you, there's going to be writing. Okay? That's the way it is. And I have a, 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 what you call like hall monitors. We call them snitches <laughs> on the <laughs> bus. They let me, and they let me know who did what. And they all know. You can't do that. You, all my, my buses have seatbelts. My vans have seatbelts. If you use buses in the private sector, let everybody know you got to have seatbelts. That's federal law. Even if the school doesn't do it, if you do it in private practice, you have seatbelts on your buses and seatbelts on your vans. And kids are not allowed to get out of their seats and go to one seat to another, throw things get up or down, climb under or over the seats. My kids are very well trained and disciplined. That's the uh, beauty of this is at your point of enrollment and everything is we do a 30, 45-minute orientation with parents so they know 
what our policies and procedures are, our parent responsibilities are, and what the kids are. We talk with the kids. We have an orientation with our children. Here's how we're going to act. Here's how we're not going to act before we go on a field trip, before we pick you up. All that is discussed. Everybody knows. And you just train them. That's what we do. We train. I have a dog that's usually sitting on my desk here, okay, a little chihuahua. He's mm -hmm. trained. If I could train a dog with a goodie, uh, I could train a five-year-old kid. Theoretically, they're smarter than my chihuahua. So uh, we do real well with children. We can take 100-plus kids to the bowling alley, and people turn around because you know what? You can hear your heartbeat. There's not a word. Mm -hmm. They all walk in, line up against the back wall with my instructors. And when they go up to get their shoes, five at a time, please and thank you. Now, when you're bowling, you can be a kid. But when we're coming there and leaving, it's absolutely quiet. Absolutely. People can't believe how we do it. I can't believe that they can't believe that we train children. That's what we do. I've got the only brochure rack at the bowling alley from an outside entity. Because, one, we bring them a lot of money. And, two, he loves how we train the children. You can bring that many kids in there. They're not out of control. He had two women in there. It could have been two men. It's not a sexist remark. But there were two women in there with about 17 kids from a daycare, completely out of control because they're not paid to train them. They're paid to give back a live child at 6 o'clock with sand in their shoes. That's the definition of extended day or daycare. You've shared a lot of great stuff today, and I, and I appreciate that. Just, my, my head is almost reeling, and this is one oh, of those so episodes sorry. I think. No, don't, don't apologize. It's great. I suspect this is one of those episodes that I'm going to get feedback from people. I had to listen to it twice or three times. Well, you're times. talking to an old person that's been around. I'm, you, know, you, know, yeah, you, you know some stuff. But I've been, I, been I, around. I've met, met a lot. I've met everybody in the martial arts. Everybody. I've had you know breakfast and lunch with Chuck Norris. I played golf with Bill Wallace. I met Joe Lewis. Pictures on the wall here. I was uh, hanging out with him in uh, Las Vegas. And, you know, when you get old, you get to meet everybody. But I go back to a lot of people. People that know martial arts know who Mike Foster is and Yamamoto and, and yeah. the quarry and, and and those kind of people uh, back in the day. When I was in Vegas, I got to train with Osama Ozawa, the first uh, uh, highest ranking Occidental in the United States in Shotokan. I used to sneak out of the Taekwondo Dojang I was at over there and go train with him. And uh, then they started. I was at the very first tournament. It was at the Riviera Hotel. That's the uh, uh, Ozawa Championship. That was big time in Vegas. Ozawa Championship, big time. I was at the very first one. And uh, Kenny Blanche and I think Nasty Anderson was there. And and uh, uh, so, you know, I, 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 when you're old, you get to know a lot of these people. But they're, they're all dropping like flies now. He's gone too. So, yeah. Well, all right, my man. I, I want to ask you one more thing, just one last yes, little bit. Parting words, words of wisdom, whatever you want to call it. Send us out with something. Of a high note. Oh, I'll be honest with you. It, it uh, I know I talk a lot about it, but uh, if you have a after school program, you can contact me. I can see if you're operating it legally and correct, because you could be flying under the radar, either knowingly or unknowingly. And I, you know, I know the codes in about every state, and and, and they change, and they change from time to time. Georgia's coach changed. Florida's coach changed. We changed the law in Virginia ourselves. We changed the law in Texas, okay? Uh, but I would say if you don't have an after-school program, consider it. And uh, it's hard for people to change sometimes because they're, they're successful in, in what they're doing. There's nothing wrong with that. And if you're happy with what you're doing, then be happy. Uh, you might be able to put, uh, uh, like I said, an after-school program in your school in a small way. Get one van. Maybe do a, 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 a two trips, get 25 kids. That's another 100 grand a year. Who wouldn't want another 100 grand a year? But um, I, would, I would think if you're, if you're running a martial arts school, like most people, and you don't have an after-school program, you're running on seven cylinders. You're not running on eight cylinders. I just think uh, you should have a transport after-school martial arts program because the difference is our evening programs are a luxury. Okay, People don't have to take martial arts. We love it. We do it. But the after-school program is a necessity. These kids absolutely, positively have to be somewhere after school, after summer camp. They have to be in daycare, extended day, or babysitting. Why not be with me and you learning a talent and skill? It's a no-brainer. It's just a no-brainer. And they pay three to six times what everybody's evening student does. That's a fact of life. So I would say consider it. Take a look at my site. Call me. 
And, uh, I'll, you know, I can tell you what the codes are in your state and what you'd have to do or not do to do it before you take a jump. I would never sell anybody a program anywhere that couldn't legally uh, operate uh, my program in their state. There's other people out there selling programs and uh, that I end up cleaning up their mess. I don't have to mention who they are. And uh, it's, it's getting me new business, <laughs> but uh, you, I just would never sell a program to somebody that couldn't legally operate it uh, per code in a state. I just wouldn't do it. But I'd consider just doing an after-school program because it's, it's, uh, it's life insurance for a school. That's a fact. If you've been a long-time listener, you know that there are episodes where I have to do a lot of work. I have to coax the best stories out of the guest. I have to keep them talking. Well, today, as you notice, was not one of those times. Kyoshi King was so generous with everything he talked about, and I got to just kind of hang out and listen almost in the same way that you all did. And that's a lot of fun for me. It's different, and it gives me a much different perspective on how the show runs and gives me a different angle on the guest, and I love all that. So, Kyoshi, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your stories, your wisdom. Really appreciated having you on the show. If you want to find the show notes with links to the things that we talked about, Kyoshi King's school, his after-school program information, all of that, you can find it at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And of course, you can find all of our products, from our sparring gear to our apparel, at whistlekick.com. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>